Well, welcome. Uh, we have three papers uh, all surrounding the live music business coming up right now. And uh, we're going to really jump right into it because 30 minutes and three papers can go through uh, really, really fast. Uh, I'm Wolf Osterley from Syracuse University, and we are going to start things off with uh, Armin Shimonian and Young Jin Huang from the University of South Carolina. Uh, both pulled together a paper that was exploring virtual concerts. And um, this, yeah, a lot of acronyms here, VLCs with BTS is the way that uh, I like to look at this one. Um, can you take us a little bit through your thought process and why jumping into um, this particular research? Certainly COVID has an impact on this, but I think uh, you know one of the statements you made in your presentation was there wasn't much research out there for virtual live concerts. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having our paper. I'm I'm going to start off and then give it over to Young Jin, who did more on the of the data sets. But really, you know, BTS is such a major group. They had a little bit of difficulty breaking into the American market until they finally wrote an English song. You know, they did really well internationally, but for some reason, they weren't getting a lot of radio play. And and there's been a lot of articles and discussions about it being in Korean and it wasn't English, so people weren't interested. But that wasn't really what the data was showing. Now, during the pandemic, all of a sudden, artists had to figure out a way to reach their fans. So as you guys remember, early days of pandemic, we had, you know, live streams, artists playing from their living rooms. And then that kind of grew. And some of these bands ended up doing bigger and bigger productions because the technology was there and the production was there. One of the interesting things is if you just Google live stream production companies, there are things like um, Brand Live, Be Live. Uh, Skystorm. So all of a sudden you have these mega companies with capacity to put on a full, you know, high budget, high intense production and then have the data to live stream it. So we looked at this and we realized that BTS was doing two events in October of last year. Uh, and what they did is they sold tickets, hundreds of thousands of them within minutes and live streamed two live concerts, essentially big budget production, full stage, everything full set up with tons of cameras around them. Um, and it was a very, very successful event. And actually, interestingly enough, T-Mobile ended up doing a sponsorship agreement, I believe with Justin Bieber, who did a similar type of situation in Las Vegas for New Year's Eve. So T-Mobile offered this for free to their subscribers. And I think it was 20 or $25 for everyone else to essentially buy access to see a live concert. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Young Jin to talk a little bit about what he, what his thought process was as far as for the data and how he came about. Thanks for the intro, Armin. Uh, I'm going to say more in research perspective. Uh, from prior literature, we already know that what makes people satisfied in live concerts. There are multiple components from artist, the sound quality, the venue stage setup, and the social interaction in the event. However, we do not know yet what makes people satisfied with virtual live concert. Because of, of the difference between live setup and the streaming service, we are not sure whether we are able to apply the existing concert satisfaction model. So using this data set in uh, BTS concert, uh, we try to figure out uh, whether we are able to have a new model uh, that explain why people are satisfied with virtual live concert. So we identified three key components of virtual live concert satisfaction, which are artists, the sound quality, and the virtual stage setup. And then we dive deeper into the three components and we statistically tested uh, the importance of each component. And it turned out that the artist component obviously the most important. However, the audio component, like uh, what device they use doesn't matter, but it, doesn't say it is not important. Uh, obviously, that was because some limitations of the study. And then the video component, it was quite interesting because uh, the level of satisfaction, it is not proportional to the size of the screen. And uh, we were really intrigued the fact that uh, even watching the mobile component, it, it was much more satisfied uh, compared to using the small size TV. So we uh, guessed that that is probably because of the, uh, the proximity to the screen, not the actual, uh, the main factor probably not because of the size of the screen. And uh, we just submitted this paper to our journals. So hopefully we can communicate through the paper more. 
Obviously, we are limited with the time right now, so we cannot explain everything. So I hope we can communicate better with the paper. I think one of those elements that uh, you guys did talk about in your presentation that was recorded was your uh, sample size and who you pulled together. And it was uh, over 500 um, individuals, all from South Korea. Um, how did you go about finding those who participated in this? What was that process of getting those people to respond to your survey? Mute. I was lucky to find a company in South Korea. Uh, they had the database who, uh, of consumers who attended the event, who actually purchased the event and, and attended the event. So it, the company was able to validate the participant. So sadly, I had to pay a lot of money for them to collect the data. So it, it was basically uh, one marketing company in South Korea. Well, it's fantastic to get that access, even though there's a cost associated with it, because, um, you know, this is the first step of establishing where we can go with research in this area. You know, two of the areas that you did not look into because of the fact that these are virtual facilities and the audience interaction were two factors that we see in live concerts that we sort of discounted here. Uh, do you anticipate in engaging with any audience interaction in your studies? you know, co-viewing with multiple people on a live stream? Or is that something that is... Uh, so that, yeah, that is a very good question. And I had the same concern. And in my virtual live concert model, we didn't include the social interaction factor. That's because the current live, the virtual live concert, especially with the BTS setup, there was not much interaction. But that does not mean we cannot do interact. But that was because of the limitation of the setup. I mean, they used some uh, chatting feature, but it's really hard to interact with other fans. So in my paper at the end, I suggested that we may be able to come up with new way, new way how we can communicate uh, using fans. So I do not have the answer quite yet, but there's, there are obviously multiple ways to do. As we head back towards live events in person, Based on your research, do you expect uh, virtual live concerts to, or do you suggest others to keep this as part of their mix, given the fact that you know, when you were looking for satisfaction, it did seem that people were satisfied with these events? So I think that uh, one of the contributions of this study is that uh, the, the current industry has just identified new type of the consumer service. So even if we are going back to normal, I think that the virtual live concert still can be a great way to communicate with consumers because uh, the data it shows the evidence that even if they love live concert, they are still satisfied with the live concert. And I also asked in the survey, and after we are going back to normal, are you still interested in attending virtual live concert? And most of people said that they, yes. So. Uh, I guess that uh, virtual concert, live concert, although they sound similar, but they are two separate services. So I, I, and I think that even after we are going back to normal, people still love this type of show. Yeah, I think, I don't think you're gonna, I think it's essentially a new product that's gonna be offered at a much better quality, right? And so now that you're seeing more and more folks go on tour, I believe you're definitely going to see these kinds of production companies go along with them and either live stream to a smaller community where it's too far out for them to go on tour. They don't have the size of stage that they'll need. And yet they can still bring in a good amount of money for, for the, for the band. And so I think this is definitely a, a byproduct of, of COVID that definitely ended up becoming a real thing much faster than maybe anticipated because of everyone being at home. But I definitely think this is here to stay. I think the, the idea of a live concert being streamed in high quality is, is, is here. Yes, and also considering the huge success of this event, and we think that we just find another good channel for sponsors to invest their money. Like for example, the video component, it is really important. And Projector was obviously the best one. What if a good Projector company like Sony a sponsor uh, watch this BTS virtual live counter with us, and I, I'm pretty sure they are going to sell their product more. 
And final question before we move to the next papers, what does future research look like in this area? You know, is this something that you're going to continue? Um, you know, is this future research that should happen in certain regions? Because I know you mentioned the fact that this is not applicable to the entire world, given the uh, audience that you were uh, reaching in South Korea. Um, but I think your experiences with this paper uh, set the stage for where we can go. And so future research, I think, is important for us to discuss. Love to hear your thoughts. Yes, uh, we already plan to have like more than four papers out of this one. And one would be obviously about the social interaction, whether we are able to still communicate with consumers in the virtual life setup. And also this study has some limitations. We were not able to control every component. So we want to have more rigorous setup in the next setting. And also uh, BTS is pretty famous. And what if we have virtual life concert for consumers, like for like indie band, small band, and if it's still going to work, we are not sure yet. So that, that can be another way of my research interest. So I be, uh, basically, I'm going to conduct more than three, four papers out of this one. Yeah, and, and I was just going to add to that. One of the interesting uh, discussions yesterday at the audio engineering panel was the fact that you really needed faster data and how 5G is on the rise in the U.S. And you will need that for the audience, right? We, we discovered that folks enjoyed more interaction. They felt closer to their favorite artists by viewing their live stream on their phone. Well, in order to do that, you got to be able to be everywhere and you need to have better data access. So while the production aspect of it might be there, I think we're still waiting on to make sure that everybody has that fast access to data. Uh, so I think that's also going to be part of the rise of this as, as access to data goes, goes higher. Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much for your insights on this. I think it's, um, you know, the first of many studies, as you've mentioned, that you have in the, in the works here, and it will certainly set the stage for others looking to research uh, in virtual events. So thank you. Uh, I would like to move now to Adam uh, Caress from the University of New Haven, um, teaching uh, the live music industry in courses where he's actually taking the, um, the classes and building out actual events in person, although this year a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit of a challenge the last year with, uh, with COVID. But um, I'd love to have you quickly just run through um, in, in less than a minute what this whole process is like. And then I've got a, a series of questions I'd love to run through. Sure. I just had really, really positive results. Um, just really great student feedback um, and uh, with this model of teaching uh, the live music industry with a hands-on approach, um, which is having the students be essentially promoters, the class is essentially a promoter, and they do everything a promoter would do and put on a live concert. So over the course of the semester, they plan a concert. At the end, they put it on. And uh, so that going through all aspects of it. So it's been a really great experience. The students have taken a lot of ownership of it. They feel a real satisfaction when it's done. And yes, this year... I had two sections this spring who each put on virtual live concerts and it, they were great. There was a, a, lot, a really positive experience, even in COVID times, which putting on a live event. So they were, um, they were flexible and able to, you know, change with what was going on. And it added a whole other layer, um, adding that technological element of making sure you have the, you know, proper, using the proper platform, the technology, the interfaces and everything to be able to get it out live um, on a live stream, but uh, it went very well. One of the uh, areas that you evaluate with your students uh, would be the financial success of these events. How does this year's event compare to those in the past? Was this a well, full paid event or was this a free event this year? How did you go about that? They, they were paid events. They were paid live streams. Each, uh, both classes actually set up um, their events. They have the option to set the them up as nonprofit events, and they both did one to benefit the National Independent Venues Association, and another to um, benefit a local um, nonprofit called Music Haven that provides um, music instruction for underprivileged kids. It's, so it's so both of them, but they both um, ended up in the black. They both had money that they were able to donate at the end to their nonprofit partner. Um, so they both had positive experiences. I mean, they they may raise money through sponsorships. And then ticket sales, and we're able to uh, both of them in the end, you know, have financial success. So, kind of the the break even. They need to break even. That's the that's the that's the main goal. And then, you know, as much as they can make 
um, up over and above that is great. And you've taught this as a semester long course and a year long course, as I understand it. Um, yep. Is there one way that seems better than the others? Is it better to have the longer class with lots of lead up or the shorter time period? Uh, sort of what's the best practice from your experience? It's, it's difficult. I realize it's harder a lot of times with scheduling of, of classes to have a year long class. I think that that gave us it was a little less stressful to have a, to have a whole year to build up towards it. But it's worked well both ways, because when I had the year long class, I had much smaller class sizes. You know, there were six to eight students, whereas doing it on a semester uh, in one semester, I've had 16 to 20 students. So the workloads end up being about the same. It's just uh, um, but I, I think uh, it's possible in a semester. And I know that's easier for people who are scheduling the classes, you know, rather than having a year long class. That's hard to fit in a lot of times with uh you know, with, with the rest of the classes that students have to take. With a class like this that is hands-on and, you know, you're putting events together, uh, there are certain challenges and there's certain risks. How does the university or your department uh, embrace those challenges? You know, does risk assessment go through everything with you? Um, because there might be others on this call that want to start a class like this and uh, there are challenges. So I'm wondering if you could give us some insight onto that process. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is financial risk. I mean, there's the possibility these events will lose money. So, I mean, we've uh, I've been able to have departments that have supported the class and have committed to, you know, a certain amount of, you know, we I have to, you know, limit that risk financially as far as what it could possibly be. But we try and set it up, um, and sponsorship becomes really important because the students are able to get sponsors, and that really gives us a cushion that allows these events, it's very unlikely that they're going to be in the red at the end of the day. So, so that's a really positive thing. Um, but yeah, you have to talk about it with your department as, as far as the financial risk. But so far, overall, if I added up all the classes, it's been net in the black overall. So um, there, it's possible we, I had one class that did, you know, was, I don't know, $500 in the red. But I mean, it, it's really not a huge amount you know, but then there are other risks too. So I've had to, you know, work with our, you know, um, PR office or marketing office to see if they, like there were some sponsors that, you know, might be uh, not ones that the university wants to partner with. There might be um, some universities might not want to have explicit music, you know, um, at the concert, you know, all of those different things kind of are on a case by case basis, but I think it's really good to have a back and forth with the, um, with the uh, university. I mean, the, our, where I'm at now at University of New Haven, the, 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 as far as uh, they, they regularly put on contract, concerts. So having, they have a standard contract that includes the provisions for insurance and all of those types of things. So there was, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel there, but I think it's, uh, I would highly recommend if you're gonna do this, you know, being in touch with the administration, especially in your department. Um, but it's a really good, um, it's been a really positive experience for everyone involved. I think it's definitely worth it to do that, you know, kind of due diligence ahead of time to make sure it works out well. You've got your teams, you know, sort of the, the subgroups that work within this. How much of that is uh, production hands-on? Are you uh, outsourcing people to do sound and lights or are the students handling that as well? It depends. Um, we have, uh, we have a uh, sound recording major in addition so this class is a music industry class from the music industry program but we also have a sound recording uh, major at um, University of New Haven and a lot of the students who take this class are in that and they tend to gravitate towards being in that production group so um, they can do it either way they can it, it's up to them if they want to if they have the scale of production that's beyond what they are capable of they have to hire out so we've had classes that have hired a production company that actually comes in and sets up staging and, and the lighting, you know, trusses and all that stuff um, for us. And then we've had classes that have done it themselves. Um, this year, there was less lighting and hands-on setup because it was, it was more technological with the filming and the audio and the students were mostly able to do that on their own. So there was less expense, but you know, it's a cost to have a uh, outside company to, but these are all things that you have to consider when you're putting on an event and, so it's good for them to have to make these decisions. I mean, I see myself in these in this class as a facilitator who's there for advice, but I really want them to be able to make the calls on these questions. And they, it really, you start this class with a blank slate and there's nothing there. And they end with an event that happens, you know, and, and people watch it and people come and people pay for it. And it's, 
um, it's great for them to have that kind of tangible um, takeaway at the end. Have you had to step in, you know, and say, students, this is, you can't do this. You know, have you drawn any lines like that? Yeah, I mean, occasionally. I mean, sometimes I'll look, they'll have an idea about something and I'll say, let me run this by the administration or, and and I'm happy to do that in those cases. Or they had an artist who was, you know, having contract questions that they didn't understand. And I'm happy, but we talk about those in the class. You know, we meet in the class period and talk through any questions any groups have. And sometimes I, I'm, I have to step in, but that's, you know, it's, it's more on technical stuff like that, you know, where I'm saying, well, this is how a contract, this, this is what they're asking, you know, and this is how you respond to that particular question. So I'm, I'm always there and available, but, um, uh, but it's mostly technical stuff that I, I step in on. Uh, any final like best practices, thoughts that you have for the group? Because uh, I think having these hands-on models in live is the absolute way to go. Uh, as you referenced, getting a great live textbook isn't something we have. And so acting in the moment, using current documents and experience really helps teach uh, the students. And so any, any final thoughts that you want to share? Because this is something I do think most schools should replicate if they haven't already. Yeah, I would just say it's been it like I said, it, both the um, administrative and student feedback have been really, really good for these events. So um, I would highly recommend people doing them. Um, I think it's more effective than a you know a typical kind of textbook and discussion lecture type of class um, to have them actually do something hands on. So I would recommend that. I also just want to say I know I put my email at the end of the. Uh, presentation. But if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to help people. I mean, I was lucky I worked in the live music industry for a decade um, or more before starting this. So I knew kind of what the basic elements were. Um, but uh, I'm happy to help. I think this would be great. And if I can, if there's anything, any questions anyone has, I'm always happy to, to help them try and, you know, pull, and pull something like this off. Fantastic. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'd love to shift gears a little bit uh, to somebody who worked in sort of publishing and then moved to live, um, Ben and Plum from the University of Pacific uh, has this really in-depth presentation that I hope you all had a chance to see on the uh, merch at Red Rocks Amphitheater. And um, I'm wondering if you could just give us a quick uh, glimpse into that transition, because you said you didn't have a lot of experience in the, the merch side coming from uh, prior uh, work events in, in Nashville. Um, why Red Rocks? Why Merch? Well, coming to Denver from Nashville, you know, I came from the publishing world and then transplanted into Denver teaching at University of Colorado Denver. And I was just ready to, I was just ready to get into it, man. There really wasn't a publishing scene in Denver. So it's like, well, let's, you know, Denver is a great live town. And so I had some connections and some former students who were working at Red Rocks and I said, you know, I'd really like to just jump in the trenches because, you know, I played gigs before, you know, working drummer and playing church gigs and those sorts of things. But I had never really worked merch in the trenches for an artist. And I thought, well, this is this is going to be exciting. I'm just I'm ready to get beat up. Let's go. And so I got refer uh, you know, I had a former student reference me for the job. And I said, this is going to be a great research presentation that I can just continue to build on. So this initial presentation is just the very beginning stages of some bigger ideas I have with the research. That was one of the questions that I had right off the bat. You know, how can we as college professors take what you've presented and integrate this into our class? Because your 10 tips are fantastic. I think, I think a lot of it has to do with the different, in particular, for instance, and one of the, the rules of merch that I give about know your deal. Each merch split arrangement between the promoter and the artist and how that gets negotiated, really, it, it, it changes sometimes on the city you're in and, and, the, and the venue that you're playing and so forth. And, and so I think that's one thing I would encourage my colleagues to look into and to work with their students on is that sometimes these arrangements between the splits, for instance, between soft merch and hard merch, I talked to a lot of tour managers and merch managers that came through whenever there were some, sometimes some dead moments. And they said, man, sometimes we hate playing Red Rocks because you guys take such a bigger percentage than we're used to at other venues. They're used to something more of like a 15% upwards, no really more than 20% for soft and hard merch. And, and at Red Rocks, there's this 25%, but I did notice that some had this negotiating ability to do something smaller. So that's what I would encourage my colleagues to, to really use in the classroom is that it's not always a cookie cutter a split arrangement between the venue and the promoter. And then of course, because city of Denver is involved, 
that 25%, for instance, that then gets split between the city of Denver and then Aramark, who is running the merch as well. So it gets split even further after that initial split. So it's just not, it's not a cookie cutter arrangement in every merch deal at every venue, if that makes sense. And every artist brings different merch. You know, you reference some of the best selling items being that, you know, $5 middle finger for Eric Church to <laughs> the $75 hoodie with Billie Eilish to the $100 ukulele uh, 21 Pilots. If you had to look across all of the genres and the, the you know, the, the shows you've worked over the last several years, because much of this research comes from 2016 to 2019, you know, what is the ideal spread uh, on the merch table? You know, do we need those hundred dollar or hundred and fifty dollar items, or do we need the five dollar items? Yeah, I, I would. I would say, um, you know, it was so different because the, the economy was hopping. You know, and I think it's a it's a different situation now. I've talked to my colleagues that are out there now that are are selling in limited capacity, and of course, the 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 buying habits are not what they used to be. But in general, the the spread the safe spread is you're you're in a good place, and there was a lot more volume when you're looking at twenty five and thirty dollar concert t shirts. That was what moved the most, um, and particularly with Red Rocks because it's a very special crowd that they want Red Rocks specific event stuff, and so they want to be able to say that they got that event shirt and it's never going to be sold ever again. It's almost like you know the the NFT before there was a uh, an NFT so to speak. So um, that spread of a twenty five to thirty dollar concert tee that moved in volume so much more. Um, and then like with Halsey, you know, that hundred dollar yellow jean jacket, you know, everybody thought it was cool, but no way when you spent a hundred dollars on it. But then with 21 pilots, you had kids slapping down hundred dollar bills for that ukulele. You know, it was, it, it just depended on honestly how emotional and caught up in passion of the music the, the crowd was. It had so much to do with just how um, that emotional high they were on. So I noticed that the kids at 21 Pilots and Billie Eilish were on an emotional high far more than they were at the Halsey show to buy that $100 jean jacket. Were there differences with cash and card payments? Did you find people spent more you know, uh, one way or the other? Yeah, um, they certainly spent more with credit cards. But of course, um, you know, Armin was just talking about 5G. We had these credit card machines that were running on 3G out there in the mountains and the things would just shut down. So we'd have to we'd have to create cash only lines. Um, and so sometimes that would affect our sales because most people were buying on credit card. But running on these 3G credit card machines that would just randomly kind of shut down because everyone's on their phone out there posting on Instagram and so forth, it, it takes up the data. Um, we would have to move to cash only lines. And so that would affect our sales. Most of the time it was credit card. I would say, you know, if I were just to pick a, a percentage, probably, you know, uh, 40 to 50 percent of our sales were on credit card most of the time. So excellent. You know, the, um, the move to the limited capacity show this year is certainly going to impact the, the total take at the merch table. Uh, how do you anticipate the limited capacity events to affect the per head sales? Are we going to see the limited capacity all buying? Um, what do you expect for this early summer season? Yeah, it's, it's just dropped dramatically. Um, in my presentation, I talked about the two primary merch booths that we have. Most, most of the crowd before COVID came through that South merch gate. That was about 75% of all the parking, the parking lots were down at that South exit. So that's why we had the majority of our merch at the South. They don't even have that open now. They just have the top, the top merch booth open and the, um, the amount of inventory is much smaller. People are excited because they're back in concerts, but yeah, the per head is just dropping. And the, and the deal is that, that per head is a moving target because we would have tour managers and merch managers give us a per head that was only active and accurate for say a 2000 cap venue. Well, that, that per head doesn't count when you're playing a 9,000 cap venue. So, you know, it, it was one of those moving targets of analytics that, you know, they thought they had an accurate per head, but they were used to playing 2000 cap venues and it's not the same coming to Red Rocks. So I think what we're going to see here is that we're, we're just going to have to get closer to full capacity before we can see the kind of numbers where we were used to doing, you know, 80 to a hundred grand a night. Um, you know, they're going to be lucky to get in the, in the, you know, 15 to 25 uh, range per night. Excellent. So what does future research look for you? Because you said this is just the tip of, uh, of the iceberg and where you're going with this. So what, what, 
Well, on the fun side, I wanted to do a podcast with all of my tour and merch manager people, and we would just share funny, crazy stories from from uh, uh, from working concerts and merch. Um, but on the on the more academic side, I want to partner with a sociologist and go back out to Red Rocks and actually do some surveys because, as I mentioned in my in my uh, presentation, you learn a lot about the personality types and the type of people that come out for the certain types of genres and their and their behavior, their buying behavior, and their and and how they treat people when they buy merch. So I really want to partner and write a book with a sociologist and really dive into some. Um, some interesting demographic and sociology studies of the types of people um, and their backgrounds and their buying habits and how they treat people where it's this combination of music business, fun kind of merch touring stuff, but also with the sociology uh, academic side to it. So that's, that's sort of in, in the long run, but eventually writing a book called tales from the merch booth, maybe that'll start as a podcast and eventually partnering with a sociology study of the people that come out to these shows. Well, you'll have a straight line of metalheads paying in cash and tipping. So um, they'll be ready for that one. Uh, awesome. and, and as an aside, you know, uh, add a little something on the podcast to the breakup wall, because that's uh, there's plenty of stories to be told there. So yeah. uh, excellent. Well, we are at our time here. Thank you all for being a part of this presentation. I know um, every one of the speakers here uh, would be open to you reaching out to them for um, any assistance that you need in some of your classes or to get information on their further research down the road. Uh, again, live music business is coming back. And I think uh, it's going to be a fun year for all of us getting back out to these shows. Um, Benham, Adam, Youngjin, Armin, thank you so much for being a part of this. Appreciate you all.